Hello everyone. Welcome to the Sustainable Development eTalk series co-hosted by CNS and Indian Institute of Management in Dhar. Our keynote speaker for today's talk is Khun Teresa Mathavapan, Chief Strategy Officer at National Innovation Agency Thailand. Along with Khun Teresa, we also have two special experts with us today, Dr. Tara Singh Bam, Deputy Regional Director Asia Pacific at the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease and Professor Dr. Rishi Sethi, a noted cardiologist and biomedical innovation expert. They will discuss the importance of using innovations to advance progress on sustainable development goals, especially in times of crisis situations like COVID-19. On behalf of the students of IIMI, Indian Institute of Management Indoor, I, Abhimanyu Thakur, would like to welcome our experts for today's Sustainable Development Goals Talks. Our heartiest welcome to Ms. Theresa Mathavapan, Dr. Tara Singh Bam, and Professor Rishi Sethi. We are indeed looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, Theresa, who is our keynote speaker for today, will share with us some of the learnings on how Thailand fights in the crisis time to support innovation and social sustainability. Over to you, Theresa. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm, I'm grateful to, to be speaking today. Uh, hopefully, everybody can hear me well. Uh, yes. So, yeah. yes, okay, great. Uh, yes, uh, so uh, my talk today would be, you know, regarding how we are doing here right now in Thailand on this COVID-19 situations and, you know, what are the mechanisms that we are uh, doing as a government and also, you know, as a, as a private sector that we work together and, you know, maybe sharing some of the example to you. Uh, be happy to answer your questions later on after the, the, uh, the talk. T today we talk about Thailand fights in the crisis time to support innovation and social sustainability. Uh, uh, thank you for the introductions. I've just been actually, if you are sitting in India, I love India. I love Indian food, just to say that. And uh, and I've just been recently to Mumbai receiving the award, the uh, the second one in the line, the, the fabulous Innovation Leader Award by in World Innovation Congress event. And it was, you know, I was grateful to receive that award. It was very surprising. Uh, I was the only Thai person there, and uh, and I love the name of the award. Actually, um, it sounds great. Um, anyway, I've been working both in uh, public sector and private sectors. Uh, now I'm, you know, in this role in the in the government as government officials, uh, trying to, you know, combine together how to be innovative in management using the uh, private experience as well in order to, you know, achieve some of these uh, projects that we are doing. Um, let me now uh, brief you just a little bit so that you know we get to know each other. Um, Right now, the organization that I work with is called NIA, uh, National Innovation Agency. Uh, we are under the Ministry of Higher Education, Science, Research, and Innovations. Uh, the name is quite long. It's a ministry that's just been reformed. It's a new name ministry. The past name or the old name is called Ministry of Science and Technology. So in the, in the past year, for about one year plus, uh, the reform happened and we combine higher education university with this uh, science and technology. So we now work together under one roof of research and innovations. So for the organization itself, we basically have the mandate to enhance national innovation system uh, for sustainable values. Uh, we strengthen the system working together as a catalyst or you know strategies in the community, increase access to innovation infrastructures, uh, upgrade skills and capability in the country. Uh, and we, by doing that, there's many, many mechanisms that we do. I give you some of the examples, uh, financial support, non-finance, uh, we give grants, we build uh, techn technology, and innovative capabilities of enterprise and entrepreneurs. Also, we you know try to work together in a network uh, type of situations in order to bring up the capability of the private sectors. Of course, the culture of innovations and creating international exposure, as we are talking now, um, and partnership. Uh, so, you know, uh, not to go into detail, but yes, many mechanisms that, that NAA is doing. We are a national agency, but quite small in terms of our staff. We have only about 100 per people. Uh, so it's a small agency, but we're doing more as a, a, 
a system integrator working with other uh, people in players in the community or in the in the arena uh, and with that so we work with entrepreneurs we work with enterprise we work in terms of uh, financial mechanisms um, venture capitalism and you know create awareness and of course informatic and foresight so i'm taking care of the foresight institute as well you know, doing innovation is not just about the present, right? It's about the future. It's about looking at the trend, seeing what's going to be coming up later, and then trying to finding scenarios to um, to tackle that. Okay, and uh, just you know, just a little bit. The slides uh, right now it's from the WEF, and basically it said that for you to be an economy of innovation driven, you need to work in four pillars. One would be a transformative entrepreneurships, and that's what I talk about, you know, how we need to work uh, building entrepreneurs. Uh, we, you need to work on the pillar of uh, investment, financials, investment mechanisms, inclusiveness. Uh, you need to create market and of course foresight. And with that, then I'd like to, as you know, add, as, as Shofar said that, you know, uh, Thailand is, uh, is the destination of tourism. We people know us, you know us as, uh, you know, as a tourist, um, as, a, as a destination for beauty, you know, to come or, you know, uh, so about food or culture. Uh, but we want to be perceived as innovative country as well. And one of the key uh, indicator is called Global Innovation Index. And uh, Thailand right now is ranked 43 in the chart from uh, 2019. This is an index from WIPO. Uh, they're doing a global index, uh, you know, from all stakeholders. And uh, we have climbed up the rank for about seven and eight rank uh, during the past two years. Uh, that's how, you know, our performance has been. And it's quite on par on the, on the moving up the ladder in terms of uh, China, for example, they are moving up about seven ranking as well. And innovation index is, is looking at about uh, five input and two output. And these are, you know, uh, some of the factors that they're looking at in terms of a countries, you know, how you can be an innovative uh, uh, countries driven. Uh, they're looking at institutions, human capital, infrastructures, market sophistications, business sophistications, and then the output of that country, knowledge and technology output, and also creativity output. So, you know, uh, so we've been keeping up and trying to, trying to moving up on these uh, paradigms of, of, of output and input. And, and you can see here from this uh, bar that, you know, two of the uh, factors that we are doing quite well in Thailand is one is, is the market sophistications, you know, how the market had grown and acceptance and be very open. Uh, second one is the output, which means the knowledge and technology output we're doing better uh, in terms of the other uh, factors and other countries. So yeah, just to touch upon innovations uh, index so that you have some ideas. And then, you know, then that's why we want to be perceived as innovative country. Innovation Thailand is a campaign that we want to shift this new, uh, you know, image and then build the new perceptions that, you know, even we are in a developing countries, uh, a country like Thailand can be more innovative. This is for not only for international partners to be perceived, but for our Thai people as well, you know, so that we are not just only like, let's say labor based, uh, manufacturing or you know doing uh, something of the same but you need to be innovative right and and for thailand as a country that is very rich in culture uh we call it innovation for crafted living so you know some of the uh, aspects of our living can be craft and can be innovated as well yeah, so in this few years, we're going to do this campaign in order to, you know, create more awareness and, and trying to understand and, and build up the capability within the country, but also talking to international partners uh, to have, you know, more recognized uh, in this regard. Uh, yeah, so that's about, you know, kind of brief intro. Then we come to the situation that I would like to more uh, to talk about today. And, and I have you some examples of the situation that we are in right now in Thailand. Uh, basically, uh, we've been tackling this few months already, right? Uh, 
the same in, in global area. Um, uh, in this slide, there are some Thai words, but basically it's a, it, this slide is the global um, numbers. Uh, uh, this is from May, to, uh, May, end of May. And uh, so, yeah, we all know already, you know, we have the European group, the USA numbers, and we have Asia group, you know, the graphs is quite uh, already distinguished. We as Thailand is now, uh, as of date, we have about 3,000 infected rate. This is, you know, reported. Uh, 57 deaths, just to, you know, give you some ideas. So in a way, uh, we are not claiming anything. Uh, well, especially I'm not claiming anything, but but I'm just, uh, you know, want to point out that. So so in a way, the number is quite, uh, quite, quite remarkable uh, compared to the populations we have, because we have about 70 million in the countries. So uh, we have this uh, situation since about end of May and then April um, and then and end of March, sorry, and then April and then May. Uh, now we are, you know, only have zero or few cases reported each day. Uh, but let me tell you how we are, you know, handling the situation just to give you some ideas. So, um, so since about the end of March, we you know started to have the uh, kind of uh, the restrictions of the of the lockdown, right? And then we had the curfew uh, in the nighttime, ten to four. Uh, we have closed down restaurants and malls, and uh, you know people have to work at home. I'm working at home still. Uh, and if you go out, actually, people wearing masks is about ninety percent in in Thailand or in Bangkok. So if you if you go out, you don't wear masks, then you look you look weird, you look different, right? People would look at you badly. So in a way, that's how we are, I think, kind of um, tackling this uh, correctly in a way that we're protecting ourselves, we're protecting others in order to, to wear masks. Um, and, but now situation is getting better since May. Uh, and, and now then we are already kind of uh, loosening up the restrictions uh, in phases. So from the beginning of May and then middle of May, and now we're coming into June, we are in the third phase already of kind of loosening up the, uh, the situations of, of, of closing things, you know. So restaurants are now open with distancing, uh, social distancing, uh, even the mall are open already, some fitness center already open supposed to open already uh, so but we are supposed to you know we still need to kind of monitor monitoring the situation but that's how we're doing it because some other people in other countries are asking you know how can we uh, manage this situation I think in a way uh, it's, uh, it's strict uh, but in a way it's kind of a uh, healthy for in terms of the spread of the of the disease um, yeah, so, 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 you know, uh, and, and the, the government have a center that manages the COVID-19 and they have announcement every day, you know, how the situation is. Um, now come to the aids or the, uh, the, the support that we do as NIA and also other organizations. So I'm not going to talk too much of the big pictures. I'm talking about SME and more of the kind of, uh, you know, the support that NIA and other type of the same organization is doing. So basically we have financial support, we have market support. Uh, during this COVID-19, we have come up with some uh, budget in order to help uh, funding support measures. So NAA and other organizations in Thailand, there are DIPA or NASDA, which is National Science Technology Development Center. Uh, they are, so we together have this mechanism of giving grants and funding to SME or projects that, that are the private sector or startup that they have ready or near ready solution to help with the COVID-19 situation in many aspects. So I'm gonna talk about that. Uh, also, you know, working with the banks, some of the banks are giving kind of low interest loan or zero interest loan for them right now because of, you know, they need to recover from the situations. Also we're doing a market expansion support uh, for agriculture tech or martech, martech meaning music, art, and recreations, and promoting knowledge with universities and academy. We are, you know, all the courses cannot be done offline, so you know it's now moved to online, and that's how we are kind of uh, keeping up with the situations of uh, academic or giving our distributions of knowledge uh, from from the government side. 
Yes, and uh, and from the health industry or medtech, the, the there's project that we work together, government and private sectors and startups in order to come up with solutions uh, during these periods, uh, online applications or social distancing solutions that can help, uh, you know, the citizens or or people to handle the situations. And we have funding support, uh, and the total budget may be not too much. But you know, it's all, it's what we can do during a very short period of time. So during the past month, we uh, have been giving out already ten projects. Total budget is about one point five million US dollars, and that's how we're giving support to the projects that are uh, passing the screening that they have solution to help with the COVID nineteen. I'll give you some examples. Uh, you know, so it ranges from. Uh, mobile applications and tracking systems. So, you know, these groups of uh, solutions, they've been giving out uh, funding so that they can launch their solution that's already ready or near ready uh, to the market and people can use it freely. Uh, it ranges from tracking system, diagnostic monitoring, or uh, data collections, or if you are, you know, you're not sure about if you are been infected or not, you know, you can use this app in order to be pre-screening or talking to the uh, to the doctor um, remotely. And it, it goes, uh, the range go to even psychiatric hospitals, you know, people stress being at home, no income, they're, you know, they should be giving help and these are helping. Uh, the, or even the last one is on the expert of to read the x-ray film because the COVID-19 uh, affect your health and um, respiratory system, right? Uh, once you already get a scan of the x-ray, um, then maybe you don't have the expert in that area of remote area or, or the hospital up country to read that film. Then we can use this type of mobile devices or system, IT system to support and, and be diagnosed with that. Um, and on this portal, it's called Thai Taylor Health. These are, you know, working together in the community in order to get this portal so that people can understand what's going on situation each day where there are the affected people live in, they're pointing out, pinpoint, and, you know, where to go, what to do, things like that. So, so uh, a, a portal like this has been, you know, launched uh, from beginning in order to, in order to kind of help and disseminate information. Or even a, a hardware device like Smart Pulse. It's a it's a small hardware device that the startups or the the the, uh, pro, uh, the the producers of it, the company creating it, so that once you you know in the hospital, then the medical uh, staff or the nurses, the doctor, they don't have to go into the uh, the room of the infected patients every hours to. Uh, to test or to, you know, monitor respiratory rate or heart rate or the temperature, right? Uh, these devices can be attached to the, uh, to the patient and it send the signals of these uh, values to the uh, monitor so that they don't have to put on the, the medical staff, don't have to put on the PPE suit, they don't have to, um, you know, be exposed to the, uh, to the, to the virus as, as much as they have to. Something like that. Uh, it, the solution even go into online learning, right? For for uh, we're not talking about a big universities or a private uh, college or pi private school, and we're talking about you know kind of smaller rural area. Sometimes they don't have enough uh, tools and devices and the software. So these are some of the example that we you know they can use for uh, for free. Right. So that's more on the COVID and the funding that, you know, the government and working together with other partners trying to giving out. Uh, that's uh, on the health issue. But now we come to the social issue even more in depth. Uh, NAA has been working on social innovation for quite some time. We, you know, follow the SDG goals, uh, working on many sectors. Uh, the, you know, the sectors that we are working and, and talking more now, of course, is, is called disaster services. You know, what can we do to, to tackle the situations and, you know, working with uh, municipality, local government, civil service, or even NGO. And, and we have different type of different uh, programs to work with uh, on this. So let me go into some details. Uh, so one of it that, you know, we call it's, it's, an, it's a 
social innovation type of project that we're trying to combine together. We call it groom, grand, and growth. Uh, you know, so we have both grooming, meaning that we actually work with the regional uh, part of Thailand, uh, setting up a social innovation dr driving unit, uh, working with university in order to groom the ideas and the entrepreneur solutions, right? Giving them some small funding. Uh, these days about grooming, then uh, the government or, or NIA would give them uh, about 10 grants, uh, 10, uh, 10, 10,000 US dollars so that they can develop their ideas. Then you come up to the granting stage, which is a bigger project and that can be implemented. They probably get up to about 1.5 million baht, which is about uh, 50,000 US dollars, you know, and then go into the growth stage, which is, you know, on the market side. And, you know, we have this uh, models of identifying, investigating the, you know, the problems and defining the solutions. And then we call for in innovations. And when once we call for innovations, um, then, you know, the person can be uh, presenting both from the company, from startups, from even the, the government, local government, or the village, the community itself. If they have solution, then we combine that together in order to solve uh, the issues. Uh, and the issues that we're working with, then sometimes we call social innovation village, I mean, the area that we are working with. Uh, and now we have been setting up social innovation village in some of the part of the Thailand, uh, you know, in this examples are six of them already been set up. They are in the province that have high rate of poverty. Let's just say that so that we can tackle more on the underprivileged people or, you know, the vulnerable groups. One day of this uh, social innovations uh, project is in Nan. I'm giving you, you know, kind of a, the issue that uh, Thailand has been um, facing during this time is on the drought because the you know drought season comes you know at the same time as COVID. Uh, so in this uh, province or so in this area, they're up in the mountain. We have the drought. They don't have electricity up in the mountain either. So the solution would be a solar pump set. You know to go up uh, country, go into the hills in order to uh, find the water. You know like bring up the water. So solution would be to, you know, to get a solar pump and, you know, having um, the solar pump cannot go so high. So maybe you're doing a kind of a ladder or a step by step pump up onto the, the mountain. And this type of solution doesn't come from, you know, one, one company. They come from a different company all together and then combine. And then the people in the area or in the village are you know working together in order to get this solution so that they have the water once they you know they already at a drought period and then they can still you know moving on with their farming and their agriculture activities right so as i said crisis now for us is covid 19 but also the drought uh, so social innovation driving unit is one of the mechanism that we do in the region in order to provide service to the community and, you know, in the, in the distance provinces and provide support to the, to the, you know, to create income, career, promoting social welfare uh, for these vulnerable groups. Um, so we have different types of mechanism, as I said, social innovation village, uh, driving units, and also innovation of the city and the community, right? And then, you know, you see how we can do the impact relief. So in a way for social innovation for us right now, it's more like post COVID, it's more like post pandemic or, you know, helping issue, how to tackle, how to uh, make a re recovery plan, uh, using some funding, of course, and then we restore that, uh, you know, issue uh, to a better situation with the help not only from the government side, but from the uh, from the municipality, from the people within the area, from the villager themselves. Okay, uh, so yeah, so we giving so we will be launching like posters and then you know call for solutions of each of the regions. Uh, four poster is actually from four of the regions that we you know announcing. It's I know it's in Thai, but to give you some ideas that you know we create employment or generate income. It can be any type of solution that tackle that area more. So each of the area or region of Thailand would face different situation and then we tackle it differently. So we have been setting up social innovation uh, driving unit uh, for many 
uh, provinces already, and you know we focuses on uh, COVID nineteen right now, and uh, you will see that how is it social. Uh, compared to SDG, because we would pick the social innovation driven unit from the um, from the rate of poverty. So we try to go and tackle on the 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 problem that has more poverty rate, so that we help you know people underprivileged. One example also is in uh, in the this uh, picture, it's uh, from. Payao, it's called the province is called Payao. Uh, basically, they have a lot of elderly, and they have the goal of the community, or uh, the the uh, the hospital or the village, is to increase the the independencies of the elder. So you know, and they in in this area they have volunteers. So in each uh, of the of the province, they have what we call uh, like a health volunteer. So these health volunteer would go into the villagers, talking to the, uh, the uh, villagers and, you know, taking their uh, health or issues. And then uh, we have this solution, which is an app so that they can, you know, track, track and then recording the situations and then be able to tackle the situation with data more. Or this example, is a social innovation project that we're giving the uh, funding to, where you know they tackle what's talked about the forest fires, the impact of it, you know how the um, the fuels come from the dry leaves that you know have been combined together in the in the forest. So this solution is to uh, they it's a hardware actually, so it's a it's a fuel compressor, but it's a mobile one. So this fuel compressor can be movable, and so the villager would have more um, more income in order to you know go in and before the fire get the uh, you know trying to compress the the leaves into a, a fuel lock, you know, kind of a fuel lock uh, with the with the compressed leaves, so that that uh, that reduce uh, the fuel in terms of once we have the forest fire, which created a lot of smoke and you know situation like PM uh, two point five. Uh, last one is uh, on from the south of Thailand, you know, where we have a Muslim community and our friends need to wear this uh, hijab. Uh, so this technology is more like encapsulating the fragrance and, you know, uh, making it uh, comfortable to wear, um, you know. So, so with this technology, it's where we create jobs, uh, create, you know, community and have kind of a, so it's a recovery from from the situation as well. It can be, it doesn't have to be on the COVID-19 situation per se, but because of COVID-19, then they need more help in terms of restoring, in terms of uh, income as well. So, so these are some of the examples that I like to, you know, talk about uh, and see that uh, how we, even though it's not a big picture, it's maybe, you know, part of the mechanisms in order to help, but we are doing this all over Thailand so that, you know, they are giving chances so that community themselves can create solutions and then can help each other within the area, uh, being district, being the province in order to, you know, uh, fight together in this uh, situation of crisis. And, uh, and lastly, uh, uh, this page is uh, is where I think we as Thai have this generosity that you know they come up with some of the uh, help and support with each other during this uh, COVID nineteen situations. On the left side, you see this cupboard, right? The cupboard is called Tu Pan Suk. That's in Thai. It's a cupboard that we share food or you know fresh food or even canned food or even necessity uh, necessity thing. You um, uh, to each other. So each community can set up this uh, cupboard and then, you know, people will come in putting things there and then, you know, for the people that need uh, food, sometimes, you know, a day-to-day -day, uh, kind of uh, worker, they don't have enough income now, you know, because things are like malls are closed, everybody closing uh, the operations so they can come and get some food. So it's a giving and sharing type of thing. These type of cupboard has been spread all over Thailand right now. So, you know, um, so it, it's been quite like kind of a, a famous by itself. 
the, the right side is where we have been in, uh, complimented by some of our foreigners once we have the, the lockdown because they cannot, the tourists cannot go home. They have to stay in Thailand for, um, for a long time. Uh, some of them are backpacker. They're, you know, they're running out of money, let's just say. So, you know, some of the local food shop or restaurant are giving out food and, you know, everyday uh, fried rice or, you know, Thai food. And, and, and we've been giving some compliments uh, by, by them. And that's, that's quite nice. I think that that's some of the kind of good stories that I want to share how we are, you know, coping. But of course, you know, situations we still have to monitor. Economies are getting worse everywhere. Uh, but we still have to kind of work together and, and be supportive, I think. And, and that's about that. Um, and I'm running out of time. Uh, my slides can be also shared and you can also, you know, ask, uh, send me email to get the slides or ask questions also later. Let me tell you my email right now is uh, Teresa, T-H-E-R-E-S-A uh, dot N-I-A, uh, at N-I-A dot O-R dot T-H. And, you know, very welcome. Uh, for that. So that's about it. Uh, let me stop my slides. Thank you. Thank you very much, Teresa. Very impressed by Thailand's use of innovations and that also involving communities. We already have uh, some questions which have come up, but we'll uh, reserve them for later. Uh, and uh, congratulations for the award which you got and you. For, for being <laughs> among the top women leaders. Uh, thank so you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And we'll come, with the, come back with the questions a little while later. Okay. And sure. I now invite our special guest for today, Dr. Tara Singh Baum, who is Deputy Regional Director, Asia Pacific at the Union, to tell us about the use of innovative approaches for stronger local action for a healthy and tobacco-free society. So over to you, Dr. Baum. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Sova. Uh, this is really great uh, uh, webinar that you are organizing to uh, uh, contribute the CNS, you know, the actually CNS contribution for global health and development. Thanks for this. And also, I would like to congratulate uh, the, our keynote speaker, uh, Teresa, for, you know, achieving such a wonderful award. And uh, Thailand is always uh, one of the, the countries that believes in innovation and also local solution. So uh, I'm also fortunate that I, I, I'm also one of the graduate uh, from the Chulalongkorn U University. Yeah, I did my uh, the, the PhD from there. So it's a, it's a lovely country. I love Thailand. So with this, uh, the distinguished uh, other panelists uh, and the participants, again, they, uh, let me uh, congratulate to Thailand for receiving World No Tobacco Day Award uh, this year. That is also another great, uh, the, you know, the, the achievement for, for South Asia as well. Uh, in my presentation, I will be talking uh, about the power of subnational uh, leaders to change policy, to change systems, and change performance uh, uh, yeah, and the uh, health outcomes. So uh, I am going to quickly uh, the, the, uh, present my presentation on uh, lesson learned from the uh, Indonesia and uh, tobacco control program in Indonesia, and then how we have expanded that initiative in Asia Pacific. Uh, as we know, the, uh, the can you can you put my second slide, please? Uh, the Indonesia, the uh, even at the global level, tobacco uh, in, in tobacco control or any health programs, uh, uh, any the, the development issues, political leadership always a key, and political accountability also play a greater role uh, to ensure the the, uh, the delivery of the our. Uh, the services and the product. So to uh, to address the global uh, the epidemic, we can we can also say the pandemic of tobacco. Uh, the World Health Organization uh, so we in collaboration with the, all the member countries establish a framework convention on tobacco control that we call WHO FCTC in 2003, and it has been adopted by so many the countries more than 180 countries. Uh, that is also one of the great uh, political solidarity working together for the global public health issue globally. Uh, but the, there are some, uh, once we have the, this uh, policy in place, but uh, the many countries, they are facing the problem to have a comprehensive implementation of WHO FCTC. It's mainly we know because of the tobacco industry interference and there are many other health related issues and the system weakness as well. 
So uh, regarding the in, in uh, the tobacco control in Indonesia, Indonesia hasn't signed the WHO FCTC yet, uh, and the, uh, the in early uh, uh, 2008 and nine. There was no such a uh, great uh, uh, the tobacco control regulation at the national level, and we uh, we can also observe at that time there was not uh, such a the great political commitment at the national level as well. So uh, the, uh, the, uh, we can say at that time the uh, the situation of tobacco control was almost like a lockdown. So in my uh, the. Uh, uh, so working together with the, uh, so many uh, the Indonesian partners at the national and sub-national level, we have recognized uh, that a decentralization system is an opportunity to advance tobacco control in Indonesia. So we have initiated discussion with the sub-national leader, especially mayors, uh, at the beginning with the four uh, mayor from the four cities, and discuss about the, how can we uh, institutionalize the tobacco control in those cities. Uh, the close monitoring, the technical assistance uh, uh, and other logistical support have been provided to the cities and the uh, team was built not only with the health but also beyond the health sector like a fiscal, uh, the law and uh, many other development sector. So what happened at the end of that uh, 2010, the all four cities uh, uh, they adopted a comprehensive tobacco control program at the sub-national level. So that was really a great lesson, uh, lesson that we have learned. So learning from that four cities in 2011, we have worked with the Ministry of Health uh, uh, together with the, the mayor of four, four cities to scale up the uh, subnational tobacco control program in, in, uh, in Indonesia. So finally in 2011, uh, 11, the, uh, the, uh, together with the Ministry of Health, the union has established an Indonesian mayor alliance to advance the, the uh, tobacco control as well as the non-communicable disease program at sub-national level in uh, Indonesia. So the key mandate of the Indonesian mayors and region, uh, the, uh, the Alliance for Tobacco Control and Prevention of NCDs are to develop and implement a comprehensive tobacco control, the program and expand its membership by sharing the lesson learned, the best practices to other cities and support the Ministry of Health uh, the, in, in the key uh, health agenda to implement at the sub-national level. So more, uh, the, moreover, the, the, uh, the, uh, the sub-national leaders' uh, key role is to uh, uh, advocate the, not only the Ministry of Health, but other ministries or the, the national governments to have the comprehensive tobacco control program to identify the resources to sustain, to implement the, uh, the health program at the sub-national levels and they uh, prevent the industry uh, the interference. So all these areas, the sub-national leaders really played uh, the really great role uh, to, to uh, uh, implement tobacco control uh, at the sub-national level. As a result, uh, they are uh, uh, working together, uh, you know, they are connecting uh, their, uh, their mayors to mayor, coordinating their reports, collaborating with the different programs and on the regular communications through media and through uh, the, any other the means with the uh, local uh, the leaders, the Indonesia has achieved the uh, national regulation uh, uh, in 2012 on tobacco control. Uh, the, uh, and also at the sub-national level, the, the uh, smoke free, especially smoke free policy has been expanded to more than 325 cities and districts. Uh, and of, of the uh, three to five cities and districts, 266 cities and districts have uh, the very comprehensive tobacco control law. And if you look at in the, the map, uh, the, uh, the below the green part is, is the, the progress uh, of the, the smoke free at the sub-national level compared to in 2008, there was almost uh, the, the none of the cities here, yeah, the, the implementing smoke free. So this is really great uh, lesson learned we, we have. Uh, and it gives uh, really uh, some opportunities and some uh, the, the possible the, uh, the uh, area to uh, to expand the health uh, health program at the sub-national level. Uh, they working together with the sub-national leader, especially governors, mayors, or the district region. So they are learning from. Uh, next slide, please. 
learning from the Indonesia, uh, the, the uh, uh, subnational leaders, the, the work in tobacco control. Uh, in 2016, we have uh, they established uh, the Asia Pacific Cities Alliance for Tobacco Control and Prevention of NCDs with uh, uh, the uh, 12 other cities from eight countries. Uh, uh, yeah, as you know, the, the, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the subnational leader has a, a really great role, not only the health, but also beyond the health, to identify the local resources, to identify the local solution, to identify the local stakeholders, to, uh, to manage the, uh, the, any uh, the public health issues or the development issues. So uh, the, the, uh, the EPICAT is, is a platform to, uh, to offer uh, uh, the, uh, the an opportunity to all the different stakeholders working together for the common uh, goals. So the, this uh, the alliance uh, uh, has been uh, led by the two mayors uh, with the principle of the by the mayors for the mayors and to the mayors. Uh, the mayor Bhima Arya from Bogor cities and Mayor Francis from uh, the, the Balanga city in Philippines. They uh, they they are leading the uh, the EPICAT uh, at the regional level. The key objectives of the EPICATS are to act and make the implementation of comprehensive tobacco control policies with the effective use of local resources uh, and, uh, uh, and the human all type of resource. And then also the create and share local innovations and solution to prevent non-communicable disease. Uh, and the last but not the least, uh, the, the other mandate is to tackle and prevent industry interference in policy development and implementation by establishing rules and regulation and mobilizing the stakeholders, not only the civil society, but also the professional organization, the professional, the, the academicians and the media as well. So the key achievements uh, that we have uh, so far from this Asia Pacific Cities Alliance for Tobacco Control and NCD Prevention, as I mentioned earlier, this, uh, this, uh, this alliance has been expanded uh, and connected uh, the 65 cities in 12 countries uh, until now. And the, uh, the, the alliance has also played a uh, really critical role to, uh, to establish the country level, the, the, the mayor alliance, for example, in Bangladesh, in Vietnam, in Cambodia, and Philippines, countries like Nepal, Malaysia, Timor Leste, uh, they are also progressing to establish the uh, the local uh, subnational leaders, the, the alliance. So the uh, the other the uh, the area is uh, the achievement of this uh, of the EPICAT is to bring the uh, not only the subnational leader together but also the national uh, the policymakers they are member of parliaments so the, there is uh, the, there is a perfect uh, the you know the uh, the. Uh, uh, the association between subnational policymaker and the national policymaker, they can really work together to deliver to implement the the, uh, the uh, programs uh, at the community level. So the it uh, the EPICAT offers the parliaments and parliaments also part of the EPICAT uh, the EPICAT uh, policy advocacy and policy formulations. So in 2019, just the last year. The, the, we established the EPICAT Parliamentary Forum for Tobacco Control and NCD Prevention. So at the same time, uh, the, the media always play the greater roles uh, and also media's role is really critical to make the governments accountable, to make the civil societies accountable, uh, to make the community accountable. So the, the, uh, the EPICAT also facilitate to establish the EPICAT media, uh, the network for tobacco control, NCD prevention and TB control programs. Uh, thanks, uh, Soba Ma'am, for, for chairing the, this uh, uh, the alliance. And it's a really great uh, the alliance that we have uh, uh, at the moment to advance the public health issues. Uh, in addition to tobacco control, the EPICAT has also played uh, the very uh, critical role to inform the, the fellow mayors, uh, the cities, and share the, the information about COVID-19 and organizing the webinars and the meetings, one-to-one uh, -one meetings or group meetings to share the lesson learned and best practices. And also the, uh, yeah, it, 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 has, uh, it, it has been uh, found a very uh, the, uh, critical partners at the subnational level to have the, uh, the uh, comprehensive uh, the reports, the records, and uh, those records and the reports can be, uh, the Alliance members can share with the national governments for uh, effective management of COVID-19.
Uh, so uh, in this uh, the whole the process the union always uh, the, is a part of the, the the programs to provide the technical assistance and link the uh, mayors uh, from one city to other cities and uh, link the, the the academicians to provide the technical assistance in evidence uh, uh, generations and uh, policy uh, uh, note uh, and the other area as well so yeah the uh, the union also play the, uh, the another critical role to engage uh, uh, the media as well as the national policy maker together with the EPICAT members. So <clears throat> in, in conclusion, I would like to <clears throat> say here, some national political leadership is a unique opportunity to build the stronger political commitments, not only the commits, commitments on paper, but uh, in action. So it, uh, it can also provide a really good opportunity to find out uh, the new partnership uh, as for the local settings, local issues, and the local the agenda, and it uh, the local uh, the leaders can really play a greater role to sustain the programs and the effective uh, implementation of the, the program uh, at, the, at the community level. So the uh, the the APCAT also or the subnational leaders also offers a stronger uh, health system performance and the outcomes uh, uh, for uh, any. Uh, health interventions or development programs. So uh, uh, at, at the current moment, it is particularly important to beat uh, the, the pandemics like COVID-19, uh, the, uh, the tobacco uh, and NCDs as well, learning from the uh, you know, current health system that uh, in, in any countries, we know there are many areas that needs to be improved, enhanced uh, even uh, in the post COVID as well. So local leaders uh, uh, always can play an important role in health system strengthening, health service delivery, health information and management of the financial and the, the other technical the issues. And, uh, and the most important part is the, the, the local leaders can offer a one health approach to, to address the, the multiple pandemics such as COVID-19, tobacco, NCDs, and tuberculosis. So uh, again, the, uh, together we can bring health solution and together we can really fight uh, the, any pandemics uh, uh, like COVID-19 and any pandemic in the future. I stop here. Thank you, Shobha. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Baum. And all falls to you for the commendable work that uh, APCAT is doing. Uh, this uh, Asia Pacific Cities Alliance for Tobacco Control and NCDs Prevention. And I hope Thailand would be the next country to join this alliance. Uh, and uh, now I invite our biomedical innovation expert and noted cardiologist, Dr. Rishi Sethi, who will join us from his cath lab, uh, where he's still working right now, and tell us something about the use of machine learning based solutions for healthcare challenges, especially during pandemics. Uh, Teresa has, has already mentioned some of the uh, uh, steps they are taking in Thailand. So over to Dr. Rishi Sethi. So in times of pandemic, you know, we can have, we can have newer healthcare technologies that can help us uh, ward off these crises uh, in these difficult times. What has happened over a course of, you know, last many, many years and throughout generations, probably that man has forgotten his, you know, um, kind of uh, uh, his stature in, in, in front of the universe and in front of Mother Earth. And man is nothing but a very tiny spicule in, in terms of um, vastness of this universe. And we have time and again taught ourselves to be all powerful. And we have, um, you know, made, made, made the mistake of trying to challenge Mother Earth and thereby we have been, we have been forced into situations uh, where we really find hard to escape from. So one can never adequately be prepared for any pandemic because if we are adequately prepared and if we have all the solutions then pandemics will not happen. There would always be a microorganisms that would crop up unexpectedly anywhere on the globe which either is a new microorganism um, that has, you know, transferred itself from animals to humans. There would be, you know, maybe an existing microorganism, which we at, at this point of time, maybe thought it was insignificant. There can be a mutant form. So these microorganisms, 
would keep on cropping up anywhere across the globe from the meat markets of Wuhan to the deep jungles of Africa to maybe a ranch in Texas. And when these microorganisms catch us by surprise, then probably we will not have the diagnostic efficacy to diagnose them early on. We will not have therapeutic options in terms of medicines and vaccines. And our protocols to limit the spread would be actually naive in front of the contagious natures of these microorganisms. So um, I, I really want to quote uh, you know, one of uh, Martin Luther King's uh, phrase that out of a mountain of despair, there's always a ray of hope. So it's true that situations like COVID-19, uh, like any other pandemic, um, are a mountain of despair for humanity. But it is also true that compared to any other pandemic that has happened uh, before in history, we are actually a little better prepared in order to deal with this crisis because um, we have better telecommunication skills now, which have helped us in, uh, in sharing the data about the spread of the disease and led to its containment. Uh, we have, you have better techniques to develop um, vaccines and drugs, and they are actually still not there, but they are in the, in the rapidly being manufactured uh, category. So we might have a vaccine or might have a new drug very soon. So we, we technology wise are better prepared. We have better technologies that hospitals can use to limit the interface between the patients and the doctor and thereby limiting the contagious nature of the disease. The technologies per se that we can use can be divided into two categories. One is those technologies that uh, help us fight against the pathogen per se. These are newer diagnostic methodologies, the newer drugs, newer vaccines, um, and probably these are little more biotechnology kind of subjects and these are not the point of our discussion today. But uh, we would be focusing our attention today on those technologies which decrease the human interface during screening and treating of patients and also provide better efficacy of screening technology, um, which help us get more and more of these patients, screen more and more uh, of these patients at the same time, limiting the human interface, which, uh, which would have uh, led to a situation of a more rapid spread uh, of the disease given its contagious nature. It can be a simple uh, triaging system or a robotic system at the gate of the hospital that, that without human interface uh, sees a patient, scans his body temperature, takes his basic symptoms and alerts the authorities about, uh, about uh, the possibility of this patient uh, being a COVID or a contagious um, patient and, uh, and, and alert the authorities and thereby if the patient has symptoms um, of COVID um, or, or is by any screening methodology, then limit his entry into the common area of the hospital. We can also have technologies while treating the patients during procedures as we in cardiology like angioplasty or any other surgery. We can have robotic surgeries where the operator and the team actually sits outside the OT and perform the procedure with the help of console, um, thereby again limiting the entire team being exposed to the patient on the table. Thank you very much for that. And uh, we now open for question and answer session. Uh, participants, please type in your questions in the chat box or raise your virtual hand if you wish to speak. So uh, uh, we have very little time left, but perhaps uh, Teresa will excuse us if we overshoot the time by a little much, a little bit. Uh, we already have uh, some questions for you, Teresa. So um, okay. uh, sure. one question is that how has innovation Thailand impacted the lives of the common people and the citizens? You mentioned that project innovation Thailand. So could you share a little bit about that? Right. Um, okay. Good questions. Uh, so, so in terms of the campaign itself, I wouldn't say that you know it it matters to the uh, to the to the common people. But basically, it's so it, it's not like you know it's go into detail. Of course, it's not about the brand or the name of it, but basically it's the it's the mechanism or it's the uh, context of it right that we want to uh, create this awareness within the country but also outside 
uh, for inside, then you know we want people to believe in themselves that they are confident that they can be creative, they can create innovations, they don't have to just buy technology, and it's not only about technology, right? Innovation is doing something new and that that create values. Uh, so so it's not about the brand. Let's just say it's about uh, mechanisms that help distribute the knowledge and distribute the awareness and distribute the confidence that we can be innovative as a person and as a country. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, another question is, uh, what has been the role of the public health system in Thailand during the pandemic? Uh, any, oh. spe uh, any special steps they took? And uh, you mentioned uh, the hardware and software like mobile medical systems. Uh, are they being used in public hospitals as well? Yes, they are. They are being used in public hospitals, uh, even the queuing system. And uh, so, so I think we, I, uh, we are ranked as one of the countries that has a very good health, uh, you know, medical system that is yeah. very distributed in terms of, uh, you know, like a big country, you know, a moderate sized country. Uh, so the health system has, is, is quite distributed. And that's how we tackle the infected people or patients. They don't have to come into Bangkok. They can be, uh, you know, treated all over the country. That's one thing. I'm not coming from the health uh, industry oh, per no, se. Yes, but, yes, I would, yes, yes, but, yes. but I can say that uh, yes. the health industry or the health uh, ministry, they're doing a very, very big part, right? So they come together almost in, in April we have this kind of um, almost like a press conference from about five medical doctors almost every day that they talk about how the situation is kind of giving trying to give knowledge because we have people are confused and not not know if this is you know that serious or this serious or not serious you know people are confused so i think that i, I mean as a as a citizen i think they i i compliment them because i think that in terms of the health industry they work together quite quite, you know, a lot during this time. And the government have the center for COVID-19 that doing a, a press conference every day, mm -hmm. still doing it now for the past three months. And within that, they have, uh, you know, kind of smaller committee to work on it, you know, uh, and, and I think we're working on the vaccines, but I, I wouldn't go into, you know, like a, a specific, uh, but I think uh, I say that they're doing a great part in terms of fighting this, right? Okay. And Teresa, your uh, talk has generated so much of interest here. We have yep. uh, another Thank question you. from uh, Rahul Sharma from Hyderabad, who, uh, who says, uh, Madam Teresa, thanks for explaining Thailand's amazing landscape for promoting innovation, especially social innovations. And do you see Thailand as a better option for sustainable businesses compared to other options in Asia? And will the financial crisis in other nations impact Thailand also? And to what extent? Mm -hmm. it's, it's impact. I think the financial crisis, I wouldn't even, you know, dare yes, want yes. to say yes. how yes. long we would recover, yes. uh, you know, on, on economics, microeconomics, and it's affecting um, everybody. And this situation of, of the pandemic, it's not about one country, right? It's a, it's a global situation. It's not, we're not going to be able to survive just one country or any country. We, so we need to to fight this together in terms of the health and the vaccine issue but also in terms of economy um, however i think that come back to sustainability i do have this um these notions that you know for thai people if you know our late king king mm -hmm. ramanai he has this um uh, th uh theory and also the kind of philosophy about sufficient economy and sufficient economy is one that you are you know kind of a uh, using your uh, resources, you know, if you're a farmer, then you build, you, you have your own house, you build your, uh, you have water to, to fish, and then you, you know, you, you kind of create your own food, and you can, it's, so it's basically just, you know, living sufficiently, and that's kind of a philosophy that goes into businesses and other things in Thailand as well. So if the business and also people are using that philosophy, even not about COVID-19, so in a way we are doing sustainability as our practice manner, right? Thank you. Uh, I'm just, um, uh, again, uh, uh, telling the participants, just uh, uh, telling them and reminding them that you please send in type in your questions or raise your virtual hand because I think we just have five more minutes left uh, For this to end. So please be quick wake up. I know it's afternoon time But don't fall off to sleep after such an energizing lecture from 
two of our speakers today. Uh, we have a question for Dr. Tara Singh Baum from Saida Deep. And Saida Deep thanks uh, ba Dr. Baum for sharing how subnational leadership is important. And uh, we are seeing in COVID how important are local actions as national promises not translating at local level unless local leadership is strong and well coordinated. Uh, Dr. Baum, do you see the uh, role of local leadership in other countries also, like India and Thailand, as I had taken that name myself earlier? <laughs> yes, Dr. Baum. Uh, uh, thank you. Yes, always uh, the local leaders can play in any setting, whether in a developed countries or the developing countries or any setting, as I mentioned. So the, uh, definitely the India, Thailand or any other countries, uh, the local leaders' role is really, really important to address any uh, any issues, yeah, because they are very close to the peoples. They are very close to the uh, the community. They know their their local uh, their settings, local understanding. They have local knowledge, and all the great things they have. So it's a really uh, great to uh, collaborate, uh, consolidate their efforts, and guide uh, properly to them for the effective management of any issues. Yeah, so always there is opportunity to expand. Yes, thank you, thank, thank you for that. Yes, uh, Priya Sahu wants to ask a question as well. Priya Sahu from I am Indore. Yes, Priya, would you like to ask? Priya Sahu. Uh, I think she is having some connectivity problem or something. I saw her virtual hand raised, so I asked her. Uh, there is a question uh, for uh, Teresa, uh, and uh, that is, uh, was supply chain affected within Thailand, uh, or has it been affected during COVID-19? And how is Thailand managing workers who might have gone home during the lockdown, and now as businesses are reopening and coming back uh, how are you all managing that uh, yeah i think we, we had quite an issue once the business closed down two months ago and you know, people going back and that that was when the the spread of the, the of the disease was you know kind of uh, becoming high in terms of numbers mm -hmm. uh, but I think uh, right now, uh, business starting to reopen. I think they're coming back. We're starting to have traffic, you know, again in Bangkok. I think, as, and, and what the government or the health ministries are trying to do is, you know, trying to say, hey, we cannot let our guards down. You people have to wear masks. You still have to keep, you know, I, I, in percentage, I think people are being, you know, kind of take it more easy uh, because we don't have infected numbers of, uh, of, you know, a lot of infected numbers of, of, of uh, patients during the past month already. So people are losing up. But anyhow, I, I, uh, I think the government or the health ministry are still doing quite well in order to issue that, hey, we still have to keep our guards and people need to wear masks. Mm -hmm. um, for people who coming back from, um, from other provinces, I think they already start coming back because things are reopened. Some of them probably still stay there, you know, what if they have other like incomes or other uh, careers to to manage to manage. Uh, so so we still see I think still have half. Also, a, a questions about logistics or supply chain. It, of course, it's infected. It, it's definitely and um, you know. Uh, uh, but but so far, all in all, because of the, the curfew is only at night. They, I think we're trying to man, manage and operate as much as possible as as you know as normal. Uh, but of course, it's, it's a new normal. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so yeah, I, I I we don't have numbers right now. I think we still need to see more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. But Teresa, you know, in Thailand, I've seen earlier also. Uh, people wearing masks, even before COVID-19. It was not a new thing. Like in India, it was something very new. It was for the first time we are seeing people who are being forced to, of course, by government order, they have to wear masks. And, right. uh, but uh, it, I found it quite normalized in Thailand, even before COVID-19. Uh, let yes. me share. Yes. So far. Uh, yes. It's two things. One, one is that, yes, we have been, uh, we have been already kind of familiar or are not familiar, used to wearing masks. If you're sick, of course, yes. then you wear masks. I think yes. we, I have friends who are foreigners that say that Thailand is one of the countries that people, once they're sick, they have quite conscious to wear masks. But another thing is that we have the PM 2.5 issues before COVID. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, right. yeah, yeah. So, so for PM two five five, people yeah. are wearing masks outside of home because of that. So it the, the situation dragged us until you know. So now wet mask is everything for for the smoke, but also for the uh, for the yeah, COVID nineteen. Right. Yeah, right, right. But in India also, we have been having that PM two point six issue for quite some time. But <laughs> still, masks were very few to be seen. Uh, so uh, I think that was more normalized. I found in a uh, place like Thailand. <laughs> yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Baum. There is a question for you. Uh, uh, Rahul Sharma wants to know: Is tobacco increasing or reducing COVID risk? I, I read in newspapers few weeks ago uh, on the contrary, and was a bit shocked to read that. Please help us understand clearly that how does tobacco impact COVID risk? Uh, yeah, I th uh, thank you. I think this is a really great question. Uh, uh, the the evidence that we have uh, the, so far until now is that uh, smoking, uh, you know, the people. Uh, uh, the COVID-19 actually treatments and management is really uh, critical or the, the severe or very difficult in uh, in the people who use the tobacco use or uh, the uh, tobacco smoking. Uh, and then as we know from the health aspect, smoking is not good for, uh, for our health, especially for our respiratory systems. So it's a main, uh, the, uh, you know, the uh, tobacco smoking is main, the cause for the many uh, the our respiratory system like lung uh, lung health like it's uh, it's old yeah so so if someone is uh, smoking uh, the the or tobacco use uh, they 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 are found the COVID nineteen treatments is more complicated and also it, even it was the more severe uh, the uh, the outcomes including death so the the other thing is very simple uh, like when sm people smoke they 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 use their hand. You know, the frequently they are, they are, they are, their hand can, can be touched to the mouth. So that is also another risk to, to get uh, the, uh, the infected with the COVID-19. So overall, it's a tobacco is a killer, it's not good uh, product. So it, it is, it is uh, really, uh, the, uh, it's really dangerous for any uh, the, the, uh, the health uh, the issues, including COVID-19. Thank you. I think with this, uh, we come to the end of our uh, talks today. Uh, but before we end, I just want a take home message from Teresa and Dr. Baum. Dr. Baum, you are already there. So what is one take home message regarding yeah. innovations and public health? Say? The uh, COVID-19 from the, you know, the, from this pandemic, I, I think we have learned a lot of the, the, the things, especially it is really critical to, uh, to have a strong public health system. Uh, and uh, the strong coordination and collaboration with the, all the sectors. So uh, the, uh, to really prevent any future pandemic, uh, of course, we have to be better prepared and also the, the have the, uh, the, the solid uh, the, uh, the, uh, the action uh, to improve the health system. Okay, thank you. Teresa, your one take home message. Totally agree. I think Dr. Bam said it all. It's, uh, it, it's about coordination. Mm -hmm. It's about collaboration, not only within the country, but between countries, you know, and it's about health issue. And it, of course, it's a very uh, it's difficult situation when you talk about life or death and then economies, you know, once you don't have money, then you are you die anyway. So, you know, that's like, that's the situations of leaders of each countries to, to tackle. But, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, we need to learn better and use this as a, as a, you know, as a practice every day to, to accepting the change and try to tackle things as they come, but also be prepared for the futures and work together, even private and public, it doesn't matter. And also even the citizens, right, they can create solutions themselves and, and try to be innovative in this new normal. We, get, we probably have something else later next year or a year later, but we still have to, to live with that and then create a better solution. Oh, right. And, and be happy to collaborate with anyone. Yes. Yes. To yes. Come to Thailand. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. Thank you very much to participants and to our esteemed speakers for today's talks. We, with this, we come to the end of today's discussion. And in today's SDG talks co-hosted by Indian Institute of Management in Indore and CNS, we were listening to Teresa Mathavapan, Chief Strategy Officer at National Innovation Agency Thailand, Dr. Tara Singh Baum, Deputy Regional Director at the Union Asia Pacific Region, and noted cardiologist Dr. Rishi Sechi. Bye till we meet again. Stay safe 
and our sincere thanks once again to all our speakers thank, thank you. you thank you bye take care bye, bye.